this morning. Um, thank you so much for being here this morning. We are talking about the all so important topic of enhancing school safety. My name is Emily Cook. I'm the Vice President of Education Services at Bloom, and I'm going to be serving as the moderator um, facilitator here today with this incredible panel who I will introduce to you in just a second. Um, but first, a couple of quick reminders. Um, first of all, the Q&A functionality is open, so feel free to use that throughout the session. I would love to integrate your questions into the questions that I'm asking the panel here. Um, so if you click on that Q&A box on your toolbar, um, you'll be able to enter questions for us to um, hit on throughout the panel. And then also at the end, we'll take a little time for questions as well. Secondly, um, at the conclusion of our panel today, we're going to send you a couple of little items as a thank you. Um, one of them is a prep guide for the COPS SVPP grant. Um, which we'll talk more about in just a moment. And then we'll also share with you a little more about our grant and funding services um, as a follow-up as well. And you guys are so good. Overachievers, I already got one question. Will a recording of this be emailed? The answer is yes. So you'll be able to access this after we log off. And, and at the end, I'll also give you a link to um, a webpage where you can come back and, and review and get more information as we go. So um, Thank you so much again for being here. Let me introduce my esteemed panel. Um, as a mom of three school-aged kids, um, there's just nothing more important to me than um, what we're talking about today, enhancing physical security. So I'm going to um, introduce you to these incredible panelists and let them share with you a little bit about who they are, what they do, and how it relates to physical security in schools. So we'll start with Dr. Tejador. Go ahead. Hi, thanks so much, Emily. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Andrea Tejador. I am um, an education strategist at Bloom and work with districts across the country to examine their strategic planning processes for physical security, cybersecurity, and overall technology planning. Um, I am a former assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction and technology for a district in New York State. And um, I've transitioned to be working with Bloom, I guess, three years ago now. So oh thank you. We're so lucky to have you. Next up, Allison Rossi, almost Dr. Allison Rossi, working <laughs> your way to that doctor title. Oh, yeah, no. still, still a ways to go on that. But <laughs> spring of 2026, we'll have to update this slide. Um, Thank you, Emily, and thank you, Dr. Teodor. Uh, my name is Allison Rossi. I run our offerings team. Um, and so essentially what that means is that you know, I run a team of really, really smart folks within the technology space, and I curate different products together, different products and services together to create packages for our customers to solve whatever they're looking for. So it's an honor to work with, with Emily, Dr. Theodore, and Eureka to put together offerings that map against, um, you know, different grants and things like that. Um, yeah, no, really excited to be here. Thank you very much. Um, and Eureka, up next. Hi everyone, I'm Eureka Meziev. I'm the Grants and Funding Specialist here at Bloom. I interface nationally with all different um, entities, uh, private and public, um, about funding for the projects that are so important to education. Um, grants are complex and um, complicated in terms of eligibility and all the changing requirements. So I'm here as um, an, a specialist to support um, the districts. Uh, formerly, I was a grants manager for a local arts agency. So I'm familiar with federal and state level funding um, as well as private. So happy to be here. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to start with you, Allison. Um, you spend a lot of time with district leaders directly. Um, and so as you're developing those offerings and solutions that we talked about, what are the key physical security challenges that you're hearing that are facing the leaders that you work with? Yeah, so it's an interesting question because, you know, when we initially planned for this, I, I came up with a bunch of questions that people ask about the technology itself. But I think what I'm finding in terms of the folks that we work with is, you know, that that IT directors and CIOs traditionally have not been involved in physical security. Um, and it's only recently that they've been starting to be looped in. And it's not just because things are network connected or anything like that. It's they're now part of that planning process and they have a seat at the table because security is so important. Physical security and cybersecurity is so important. So now everyone's being called to the table. And 
really a lot of the feedback that I get from district leaders is that they don't necessarily, they don't know what they don't know. So they don't necessarily know how to guide different conversations and they're not sure what questions to ask and they're not sure the right framework. And so a lot of times, you know, I was on three calls this morning and, and, you know, the best calls are the ones where I ask a question and they're like, you know what, that's a really good question because I don't know the answer to that. And so, you know, if I can equip our customer base to ask the right questions when folks like public safety are in the office or the superintendents in the office, then I know that I'm doing that I'm doing my job. But um, that's really what I'm hearing is that people don't know what they don't know and they don't necessarily know the right questions to ask. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Andrea, um, just from your experience and the conversations you're having, why do you think we're seeing that responsibility shift so much? Allison mentioned you know, just that the level of importance on this initiative, but are there other reasons or other factors that we're seeing that responsibility shift um, to become a technical leader's area of responsibility? It used to be that physical security and cybersecurity or, um, you know, IT responsibilities were largely separate um, and people were able to operate more siloed um, because they weren't so connected. But today, the, the technologies that our facilities directors are relying on for physical security are all in some way connected to our networks. So IT professionals really need to be included in all those conversations regarding pre procurement because we want to ensure the interoperability of our systems. Um, everything's connected to the network. We wanna make sure that we understand how it's connected to the network, what the requirements are to be connected to the network um, and the expectations of the IT personnel and the facilities personnel, as well as principals and, and school leaders because they'll all be involved in some way with physical security. So we want to know who's monitoring the activity, whether it's something related to the actual physical security that we have in place, or if it's something on our network that we need to monitor to ensure that the physical security um, products that we have in place are operating the way we need them to be. Um, so we wanna understand those roles, the roles of the facilities and IT personnel, um, as well as the third parties that we're working with. Um, what is their role in ensuring that everything's operational, and that we're monitoring it effectively. Um, but it, it also goes beyond that, right? All the contingency management plans we write, um, information about our physical planning process, our blueprints, our building layouts, our response plans. These are documents that need to be stored safely and securely as well. So we wanna make sure that um, our IT specialists are involved so that our systems are working, but also that our documentation is secure. So what you described is pretty complex and requires a lot of stakeholders to kind of work together to build this complex solution. And so um, I know that Allison, one of your great strengths is taking really complex challenges and figuring out kind of a framing and a way to think about it um, in order to start taking action. So Allison, I'd love to hear from you a little bit about kind of where do you start when you're thinking about physical security? Yeah, I'll kind of go back to my first point, right? It's you you try and think about how do you organize questions so that you're not just all over the place, right? And so the way that I try and think about physical security is, you know, in a series of frameworks. So if we map this out, I was a math major. That was that's what I did, right? So I operated in formulas and I operate in different frameworks. And so if we think about just the context of a, of a school system or of a district or of a, a higher education institution, whatever that is, right? If we just think about visually, what does it look like? The first framework is how do I take a look at things outside the door, at the door and inside the building? So if you just start there and understand where you're trying to focus, outside the door, at the door and inside, right? And we don't necessarily need to talk about school safety as preventing, you know, catastrophic things. We can think of school safety just in terms of how, do, how does it work every day? So what do we need to know about what happens outside the door? What do we need to know about what happens at the door? And what do we need to know about what happens inside the building? So if we use that just high level framework, we can start there. So now when I'm outside the door, what do I need to do to prevent things from happening? What do I need to do to detect things and how do I recover in the event that something happens? And we can think about that just from, you know, if there's a fender bender outside, right? How do I 
protect? How do I detect? And how do I recover? And now I can frame up my questions in an organized way so that we're not all over the place when we start asking questions. And this really ties into what Eureka is going to talk about in terms of vulnerability assessments and really understanding how we can get grant and funding, grants and funding as it ties back to this. But if we take that outside the door, at the door, and inside, and then inside each one of those is protect, detect, and recover, now all of a sudden I have a framework of nine general topics, right, that I can ask six, seven, eight questions about so that I really understand how everything works seamlessly. And then the underpinning of that, right, is the technology piece. But if we don't understand how it's being, how it's, how it's actually happening in context, if we're not able to really paint that picture using that framework, then we're going to struggle to get funding. We're going to struggle to keep it organized. We're going to struggle to manage and support it moving forward. And, you know, the, the underpinning of all of that is just making sure that we have the right access for the right people at the right time. So at a high level, I'll just zoom out because I, I tend to talk fairly quickly. Um, but what we're trying to look at is just one nice clean framework that says, how do I navigate things outside, at the door, and inside? And then once I'm inside of those that framework, how do I protect, detect, and recover outside? How do I protect, detect, and and uh, recover at the door? And how do I protect, detect, and recover inside? Now, if you ask me to do that three times fast, I'm going to struggle. But I, I got those I got those six pieces Get of it. framework kind of nailed mm -hmm. down. Um, and again, if we if we follow that with our line of questioning, then we can stay really, really organized and start to paint the picture of what what the future state looks like, as opposed to just throwing products at it. Yeah. Andrea, within that framework, what are some questions that you're, when Allison says, we could ask six or seven questions at each one, what are some questions that you're seeing are kind of the right questions to be asking within that framework um, that can just kind of help us zoom in and narrow down on, on finding the right um, approach? So when we look at the protect, detect, and recover um, in those three areas, we really want to look at, as Allison said, as a, at a systems perspective and take a holistic approach to each of those so that we're not necessarily isolating one, but we're looking at how each of those impacts everything that's happening in our schools. Um, it's not just having, um, not just about having the right tools and technologies in place, but also asking those right questions, those correct questions, and also then continuously evaluating and improving our security protocols. Um, some of the questions I might ask um, what's our current security posture? Where are our vulnerabilities? Um, and how do we regularly reassess those security measures, which are all part of the requirements for the, the funding that Eureka is going to be talking about today? Um, also, how can we um, use the technology to enhance our physical security measures, right? Are our systems integrated for seamless security management? Um, and how do we ensure that our staff and students are trained on those security protocols? Those physical security protocols um, that we might drill for emergency situations, but also our administrative staff. So they know how to optimize the technologies that we put in place so that they can monitor inside the door, at the door, and um, outside the door. Also, we wanna work closely with local law enforcement. So have we planned for an incident closely with local law enforcement? Is there an incident response plan for physical security in place um, to ensure that we're all on the same page um, when we do need to respond to something? And then even um, we wanna also be able to balance the physical security and that cybersecurity piece with our right to privacy for students and staff. So how does that all um, interconnect so that we ensure that, yes, we're protecting students' personally identifiable information, staff personally identifiable information, and that we have those cyber and physical security measures in place as well. Yeah, and you talked a little bit about kind of that balancing act between protection and privacy. And then I think the other balancing act that folks are facing right now is that threats are constantly evolving. The world that we live in is constantly changing and it's requiring us to be really adaptive um, when it comes to creating solutions. So I don't know, Allison, if you have anything you want to add there in terms of 
how do you stay ahead of potential security threats? What is technology planning, you know, what part does technology planning play in creating more of a proactive approach rather than a reactive approach um, to security? Yeah, I think to a certain extent, th there are pieces of security that are always going to be reactive and we have to be okay with that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when we look in the mirror, we have to say, hey, things are going to happen and we have to be able to react and respond in an efficient way. The question is, what, what are the emotions that are tied to that? Mm -hmm. And so by planning it out and planning your reaction now all of a sudden and that's why that protect detect recover is so important by planning your reaction you can take the emotional piece out of it and it feels like less of a fire drill and it feels more like okay when this happens we follow this process and so i think the reality is the potential security threats are never going to stop the things that we need to be prepared for today are going to be totally different than they than we need to be prepared for tomorrow and so really it's about hey do i have a clean framework and it's okay that I'm not the expert, right? There are people, there are threats evolving and 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 happening that we don't even know are ha are going on, right? And so, how do I make sure that I have a clean communication plan in place? How do I make sure that I understand what my tech stack look like, looks like? And how do I make sure that I have the right processes in place to prevent what I can, right? And then when I when I do react, I, re I react in an unemotional way. I have a plan for communication. I have a plan for what people are doing. And I have a plan for what the technology is or isn't doing and how I respond to that. It sounds like a really fluffy answer, Emily. And to a certain extent, it is. Um, but the reality is, as a parent of, of, of students in schools, right, you know that things are always going to happen. I was watching a, a post the other day, and it was about, um, you know, administrators and now they're walking around with carts, right? They've, they've abandoned their offices and they're walking around with carts. And, you know, they were referencing the fact that, you know, if a student throws up in a classroom, now they have a nice clean process for how it's handled. And we're not going to stop that stuff from happening, right? We can't stop everything, right? We just have to have the appropriate response so that teachers and students have kind of the customer service that they need in order to continue learning. And if we search, uh, if we start changing our, our mindset when it comes to that, now all of a sudden we're going to be able to, to adapt to the different kind of threats that, that are coming into play. That's funny. I, I'm very aware of the principles rolling around on cars <laughs> as well. I, um, I love it. And I think what happens as a result of that, and I'm not suggesting every principal needs to be working from a cart, but what happens as a result is that they have a much closer ear to the ground about what are the trends and what's actually happening in classrooms and where do those risks actually um, show up. And I think when we kind of zoom out and think about that bigger picture, what we're talking about is a data-driven approach to planning, right? Is gathering that data constantly. Wh where do we have risks? What's, you know, what are the kind of our top areas of need that we need to plan for? So um, I know, Andrea, that that's a hot topic that you love to think about is that data-driven decision-making. So I don't know, you know, do you want to add anything there about kind of what information a district might have access to um, besides the anecdotal from the principal on the cart? In addition, what other data might a district be able to look at to, um, to really inform their decision-making? Yeah, whenever we engage in um, decision-making or planning process, we want to make sure that we're designing with those metrics in mind. We don't wanna come up with the metrics after the fact. We really wanna design our plan and be um, action oriented based on the data that we have um, at the time that we start that. So some of the um, some of the metrics we wanna look at, you know, again, if we're looking at this from a systems perspective, from a holistic perspective, you know, what can we look at in terms of creating a safety strategy um, that's related to physical security, that's related to prevention, that's related to well-being, and again, going back to cybersecurity, connected to, to our cybersecurity program. You know, some of the metrics we might want to consider, most school districts use a school climate survey, so that's a really great source of information um, when students, parents, and staff respond to a school climate survey answering questions like, you know, simple questions like, does your child feel safe at school? Or do you feel safe at school? Um, that gives us something that we can use before our security measures are put in place, as well as taking a look at that afterwards and see if there's a change. Other things we wanna take a look at might be discipline data, um, student well-being information, um, mental health data, 
and data connected to even the websites that students are visiting on a regular basis. And that information can be gathered from internet monitoring software. And putting all of that together helps us to create um, or paint a more complete picture. Okay, so I'm gonna stick with you here for just another second, Andrea, and ask about, we we talked about a lot of challenges that are facing folks. We talked a lot of, a lot of areas of overlap and um, collaboration that need to happen within a district. Um, and then a lot of places we can gather data from. Where does someone start when they're thinking about building a comprehensive plan for physical security? We, we wanna start with doing a physical threat assessment, right? And um, as a part of, of that, you really want to have a threat assessment team that can lead the conversation around comprehensive planning. Um, and that team should also have access to those metrics that we just mentioned so that they can make informed recommendations about the district or school security plan or program. Um, you also wanna consider as a part of the overall plan, a communication plan. And Allison mentioned this briefly as well. Um, you know, are there systems in place? Uh, feedback required to create effective systems. How are you getting that information? Um, what's the training again that you need to ensure that stakeholders understand their role and how to use the tools or the technologies that are in place? like um, two-way communication systems, uh, alert buttons, features that are included in the classroom that might not have been there historically, and also um, you know, technologies that principals might not have had access to historically, and how do you train everybody and scale that implementation? And that's why a strategic planning process is so important. Um, you wanna start by identifying potential risks um, and vulnerabilities through that physical threat assessment and that would include a comprehensive cyber or physical security audit of the school premises, evaluating you know, your current security measures and protocols. Um, you want to take a look at gathering feedback from your key stakeholders, your teachers, your parents, counselors, mental health professionals, law enforcement agencies. And then based on the findings and the risks that are identified through that physical threat assessment, you can really start to build a tailored security plan um, that includes the specific security measures that you might need. Security cameras, door hardening systems, communication systems, whatever is identified as a part of that process so that you can do a, um, essentially a gap assessment, right? To understand where there's gaps in your security program. And then um, what are best practices to, to close these gaps and to address some of the issues that you identified um, while going through this process. And all of this planning is required if you're going to apply for federal funding. Um, you have to include diverse stakeholders in the conversation. You have to um, have completed a physical threat assessment and you have to be able to use that information to identify what your needs are and why it's necessary um, to request the funding for these measures. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so that's the perfect transition. Eureka, I'm so glad you're here. Um, so you, I'm hoping you can just kind of talk us through a little bit about the funding available through COPS SVPP grants and how folks can leverage that to accomplish their security goals. Sure. Thanks, Emily. And Andrea, you're right on about the physical um, threat assessment and vulnerability assessments. Um, I'd like to take a moment to introduce the COPS um, Office School Violence Prevention Program, SVPP for short. Um, just as a disclaimer, this has not been released yet, but it is scheduled to be released sometime soon. Last year, it released March 15th. So we are in the sweet spot of any day now, this uh, federal program will open. Um, but yeah, the SVPP is a competitive award program designed to provide funding to improve security at schools and on school grounds based on evidence-based school safety programs uh, that, that's been recommended through your vulnerability assessment. Uh, on the we have the eligibility requirements here. Um, 
of course, uh, local governments are available, but in terms of in the education sphere, school districts, um, including public charter schools um, and districts with single schools are eligible to apply. Um, however, individual schools um, not operating as a school district or private schools are ineligible. Uh, the SVPP has project goals listed here, but we would like to um, highlight that it does, uh, the, aquas the communication is a huge uh, topic for this. So how are you communicating uh, incidents with your local law enforcement, how to speed up those, um, that communication, as well as school hardening initiatives, such as metal detectors, lock sliding, and other deterrent measures. Um, applications are evaluated um, on the impact that this uh, project will have on improving your school safety, as well as um, the, your financial needs, as well as other factors. So um, this is a very exciting program. It is capped at half a million dollars with a 25% match required. Uh, so it is a big, a, a big project and it is federally available. So all 50 states, um, school districts in all 50 states are uh, open to apply. Thank you. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more in just a moment about kind of where you start um, if you're interested and in, in eligible. Um, but one of the things that we've talked about is those vulnerability assessments and the need to partner with local law enforcement in order to complete um, those assessments. Andrea, will you just share with us a little bit more about what are some of the partnerships um, internally that a district should be considering when looking at applying for funding or, or really planning for this type of initiative regardless? Well, when you think about your threat assessment team, who is on that team um, internally in, in, in terms of your district or your school? Um, you definitely would want somebody from the facilities department as well as from your IT department um, site administration, you want representation for, of your principals, um, assistant principals perhaps, um, as well as um, uh, guidance counselors, because they'll have information about, you know, student well-being and trends in student well-being as well as attendance. Um, so internally, you really want representation from those stakeholders within your schools and then at the district level too who at the district level is really monitoring data. Perhaps that individual, a, a CIO, needs to be involved in the, on the team as well. Um, and then kind of expanding that to include other stakeholders that are outside of the district, like representation from local law enforcement, because they'll be able to lead the school or district through that physical threat assessment. Um, and then representation from parents is really important as well. Um, so you want to include all of those stakeholders so that they have a voice in the process, um, the ultimate plan, as well as um, diverse perspectives on understanding sort of what's happening in the district and what's on people's minds. Awesome, thank you. All right, Eureka, um, back to you here. Will you just kind of dig in a little bit more about um, where folks can start. And, and just as a reminder, this um, these four milestones come from our Bloom um, grant guide that we'll be releasing. And so the, the first two are kind of what we'll talk about mostly today. Those are things that can be done now before the grant is released um, in terms of preparation. So um, will you, Eureka, just kind of walk us through milestones one and two? Sure. So the first milestone is to brainstorm the project that you'll be applying for um, based on your vulnerability assessment. So most vulnerability assessments will come with the recommendations of where your district is um, most at risk, whether it's a physical security um, measure or a communication, um, they will identify something that is lacking in your current um, plan. So you'll be reviewing that and seeing what um, types of projects will make sense and what technology um, can be implemented there. Uh, so as Andrea mentioned, there is a diverse amount of stakeholders that are involved in a single project. So we really encourage you to get a head start, organize um, 
your stakeholders so you can start having a discussion about the most impactful way to the most impactful projects to um, address your vulnerabilities. The next milestone is um, completing your consultations and requesting letters of support. Um, the more collaboration that a project shows um, really speaks to the reviewers of this grant as um, a project is well thought out and has community support. So um, consultation letters from uh, local law enforcement is a major um, factor in in the consideration for this grant. Um, there is a formal assurance that will need to be submitted with the grant that um, specifies that, yes, this is in line with the vulnerability assessment. So you will have to get some sort of support either way. So we recommend you getting a head start and soliciting those support letters um, to justify your projects. Um, milestone three and four uh, is registration and data collection. I would still wait on the data collection as the questions may have changed from last year, uh, but the registration is if you are um, have received federal funds in prior grant um, rounds, this this will look like the SAMS registration, as well as um, specific uh, portals that will require that will be required for the federal um, submission federal grant submission. So yeah, this will all be summarized in the um, grant guide and we're here to support you in understanding some of the requirements for this grant. Yeah. So speaking of you being here to support folks, I wanted to just give you a moment to kind of talk through what services you can provide in order to support districts that are going through this process. Sure, these four um, services that we have up on the slides is our core support, which is application review, where you will be, you can leverage us as uh, reviewers for your uh, narrative questions and we'll ensure that uh, your narrative is matching up with the review criteria as well as clarity. Um, so technical um, aspects of your narrative. The Bloom Grant Guides, which will be available to you, will not only go through the first four milestones, but um, the, the actual writing as well. Um, so it'll be bullet points of what is key in your narrative. So something to get you started in um, your writing. We'll also be providing informational webinars um, similar to this, um, specific for the SVPP grant, as well as one-on-one -on -one support line through um, office hours that you can book uh, calls with me and my team, um, as well as uh, email support. Um, we do offer these products um, these products to guide you, uh, but we understand that this that federal grants come with competitive requirements for uh, procurement. So we offer this free of charge with no expectation to receive any benefits um, unless until you go through your um, procurement pro procedures. So we're looking forward to interfacing with you. Absolutely. Thank you, Eureka. All right. Well. Um... Thank you all so much, Andrea, Alice, and Eureka, for participating in the conversation. I think this is really just the beginning. Um, we are going to stay on here to answer some um, additional questions if they come up in the chat or in the Q&A function. Um, for those that are with us, um, please feel free to join this web page. There's a QR code here to make that simple for you. And within that web page, um, there will be the recording of the webinar, and then there's also going to be a way that you can stay up to date. So you can put your information in, and then once the grant is released, we'll reach out to you and let you know that it's been released. And we'll also give you um, milestones three and four in that grant guide. So um, feel free to go there and kind of stay in touch with us that way. I also included grants at bloom.com email address. That's what you can reach out to in order to book time with Eureka. Um, directly if you'd like to have that one-on-one -on -one consultation or email support. Um, we've already been working with a number of districts who are looking at this and preparing for this grant, and so we're happy to um, connect with you as well to provide that ongoing support. Um, <clears throat> so 
I will, uh, we will definitely be sending out this information um, via email to those who are here and registered so that you can um, continue to stay in touch. Um, if there are any additional questions, please feel free to put those in the chat right now or in the Q&A function and we will answer those. Otherwise, thank you so much for being with us today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Can I ask Eureka a question? Yeah, please. So Eureka, I know that last year the deadline for these grants was May, mid-May. Yeah. Um, and so if we kind of backtrack now, you mentioned a couple of things to kind of get started on in terms of brainstorming based on a threat assessment and as well as um, as well as starting to get the other stakeholders and constituents involved. Um, would you say that, you know, as we as we look at that mid-May deadline, we're almost in um, April, so really that's a six to seven week period to get all the work done for the grant, right? What would you say is the number one most important thing to get done at this point? Would it be that physical threat assessment so that you have that to work from? Yes, if you um, haven't completed a physical threat assessment in the last year, I think this is the perfect time to get on um, scheduling something with your local law enforcement um, because COPS is really an evidence-based um, program where if you don't have a justification that is originating from a um, local law enforcement, then it really, um, the reviewers have a really hard time justifying your project. So the vulnerability assessment is definitely paramount to um, applying. Yep. And, and also the other thing you mentioned too, I just want to go back to the conversation about the schools that are eligible. Yes. If there is, um, you said public schools, public charters, and that private schools and, and um, uh, you know, other schools, private charters, mm -hmm. private, private charters, they're not eligible. Um, if that, if a school that um, is perhaps a, a private school, um, can they partner with anybody like a local law enforcement agency that is eligible? Sure. Or the, um, the only way for ineligible applicants to, so for example, private schools to receive funding is if they are selected as an implementation site from a public, um, from an eligible entity. So this could look like your local law enforcement selecting your school as a site to implement um, a safety, um, school safety project. Uh, it is, but, but the local law enforcement would have to be the primary applicant, applicant to COPS, um, but you, you will be um, able to provide some of the um, programmatic detail and um, information about your school and district. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great questions, Andrea. All right. Well, thank you so much um, for joining. It looks like just the only other questions and items in the chat are just more information folks would like to have. So the best way to get that would be to um, go to that, that web page that I'm sharing here and, and sign up for more um, communication. We will be sending everything out, all the new information, any updates that we get from SVPP. Um, we'll be keeping you in the loop that way. So I think that will wrap us up for today. Thank you so much um, for spending some time with us and um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.